Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. This week, we are going to talk about a topic that's been in the headlines a lot, challenges involved with modernizing the Air Force's fighter inventory. We just released a report on this topic, so we wanted to dive in and give some details behind the report to help add some perspective to the challenge that we reference frequently on the Aerospace Advantage podcast. So to explore what all of this means, we've got Major General Retired Corky Corcoran with us, who just retired from the Air Force as the Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff Operations Headquarters in the United States Air Force here in the Pentagon. And he's also commanded at the Air Force Warfare Center. He's a highly experienced fifth generation pilot. So, sir, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for the warm welcome, Slick. Great to be here, and I look forward to our discussion. Same here. And we also have Lieutenant Colonel retired Eric Guns Gunzinger, who served as an Air Combat Command Program Manager for testing and certification of the F-35's pilot training simulator from 2009 to 2020. And on active duty, he served as a instructor weapon systems operator with over 1,800 hours combined in the F-111, the T-37, the T-38, F-16, and F-18. So obviously highly experienced. And he's also an Air Force Fighter Weapons School graduate. So Guns, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much. Great to be here as well on a very important topic. Thanks. Thanks. We love having you here, Guns. And last and certainly not least, we have Doug Berkey from our Mitchell team. So, Doug, welcome back to the Aerospace Advantage. Hey, it's like always a pleasure. Doug, I want to get started with you. Why did Mitchell write this report now? We cover fighters a lot, especially over the recent years and topics that we've talked about. What's different now? No, you're right. We do touch upon this almost every year, it seems. But right now, there are two key accelerating trends in play that required extra attention and clarification given decisions that are in the mix. And, you know, as we discuss a lot, you've got a rapidly aging inventory that's getting too small, and that's really driven by budget. If you look at where the Air Force is, the resources allocated, we talk about all the time, but the Army got over a trillion dollars more over the last 20 years. The Navy got about $900 billion more than the Air Force over the last 20 years. And eventually all those bills come due, and here we are. And so the Air Force is set to retire 801 fighters across the fight up, but only acquire 345. It's not because they, don't, they think that's a good idea, they want to do it, it's because they are out of cash. And so at the same time, we've got increasingly high combatant command demands for fighters. And so these opposite demand signals are really coming in for a crash, so to speak. And that requires a reset. And obviously, the Air Force has long articulated where they want to go. They've got this plan called 4 plus 1. And specifically speaking to F-35, it's in many ways the bulk of it, where it's the highest capacity for a given price that allows you to get the mass and everything there. But it's got really good qualities on it. And so it's a sweet spot in many ways. And the Air Force has really emphasized that they want something called TR3 Block 4. And in fact, they're holding off and accelerating buys until that came available. And it really is in the mix now, coming through the final phases. In TR3, just to to clarify this, that is the hardware portion predominantly. It really centers around a core processing computer. And then Block 4 is mainly software. And it got some hardware with it too. But think about it more like TR3 is like that new cell phone you get and That's able to handle a lot more advanced apps, things like that. And Block 4 might be more like the apps that you download, but you need that processing power to do it. And those terms get thrown around a lot, but there is significant confusion as to specifically what they mean and why the service is so hung up on it. And given how important the F-35 is to the mix of resetting the fighter force, we really wanted to define both this problem, but also what is a major portion of the fix and why these capabilities they've been holding out for are so unique and important. But that's kind of my thumbnail sketch on on what prompted us. And it was really demand-based. We were getting a lot of questions from the Hill and other actors in town who kept saying, look, we know this is bad, but how do we get out of the spin here? And so that's really what we were trying to answer the mail on. Well, Doug, I think I might've G-locked or almost G-locked when you gave the numbers of retiring 
Can you give those numbers again of what we're retiring and what we're replacing over the FIDEP? Yeah. So really in, in the current budget that was submitted to the Hill, the Air Force is asking to retire 801 fighters across the next five years, something called the FIDEP, and only acquire a 345. And bottom line, from capacity perspective, that's a death spiral. We've already cut our fighter inventory by half since the Cold War. And you think about it, you've got China, you've got Russia, you've got Iran, North Korea, and then you still have non-state actors in the Middle East, Africa, and other places. This is not a safe world. You need this kind of capacity. And I just want to emphasize, no form of joint power is viable without what fighter aviation brings to the table. And so this is what I'd almost call a keystone capacity. You have to have it or nothing else works. So we really need to take care of this investment. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for doubling down on that. I really appreciate it. I want to switch over. Corky, as the deputy A3, you were really focused on helping meet COCOM demands for all the forms of Air Force capability, including fighters, of course. And we talk about that here on the Aerospace Advantage quite a bit, really focused on what COCOM demands are. So can you talk to us about the demand signal that you saw sitting in that seat? And I know Doug hits upon it every once in a while, but I really want to hear your insight and your point of view. Yeah, absolutely slick. And you bet Doug nailed it. COCOM demand is simply insatiable and we don't have the capacity required to support it, period. I'll just try to build on what he said from my perspective in my last job there in the Pentagon. First thing I think is important to talk about is the concept of risk and what type and who owns it, because that really illustrates the natural tensions that exist in our global force management allocation process. So there's generally three litmus tests that are considered by the SECDEF when he's trying to determine how he's going to respond to a force allocation decision. So risk to mission, risk to force, risk to strategy. So walking through each of those, if you're a combatant commander, your focus is the mission. You have about three years in the seat, but you're very near-term focused. Your job during your tenure is to, to make sure your region of the globe stays peaceful, right? Period, for better or worse. You're naturally going to ask for any and every force element required to do that. So you're not particularly concerned with the mission in other AORs or the overall health of the service force elements, for that matter. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. It's just it's not what you're getting paid to do. So that's what the COCOMs do. It's risk to mission. Meanwhile, the service chiefs, their job is minimize risk to force. So their priority is to build and preserve readiness, ensure equipment's in top condition, forces are prepared as possible for a wide variety of ops, including worst case fight with the toughest adversary out there. And then finally, risk to strategy. This is an area I think a lot of folks would say we've largely neglected or only paid lip service to in the past, in the recent past at least. But I truly believe there's some good reforms underway in the building that are trying to bring this one to the forefront. I just want to illustrate that. Even if you have ready forces and it's the right maybe mission decision to, some, to send those forces there, it might not be the best thing for your overall strategic goals as a nation. And we've been ignoring that, but that's really coming to the forefront now, which, which is really good news, I think, for the Air Force and for all the services. So you take all that into account and circle back to what Doug highlighted. We simply don't have enough fighter forces to fill those COCOM demands. Now, the math is pretty simple there. Day-to-day demands about 60 fighter squadrons around the globe, and we have about 55 operational squadrons right now. And eight of those, eight or nine of those are A-10s. And those are great airplanes, but there isn't a COCOM out there right now who wants them because they can't help out with the air-to-air mission that all the COCOMs are struggling with. So we really only have about 47 squadrons available to meet the 60 squadron requirement. So the question comes down to where does the SECDEF want to take risk? And in Corky's opinion, that has to be mission right now in lower priority AORs as defined in our national defense strategy for the near term. Otherwise, we're going to break the force which will cause us to fail the strategy. Yeah, for our listeners out there, you heard it from the guy who was answering the mail from the COCOMs and on what they needed. So I, I want to really dive into this a little bit more. It, what about the composition of the force? Because the report highlights that we're still very much a fighter force that was designed on the back half of Vietnam, largely procured in the 70s and the 80s. And frankly, these airplanes are worn out and they lack the capabilities necessary to fight and win in the modern threat environment. We really haven't bought enough new fighters like the F-22 and the F-35 fast enough to populate the force in sufficient numbers. So this means we're roughly at a 20 to 80% split between fifth gen and fourth gen. So how does that factor in when you seek to meet COCOM demands and what do they want? Great question. First, as I noted a moment ago, there is no desire for A-10s right now, except in an additive form. So if I'm a CENTCOM commander and I say I need two fighter squadrons and you offer to give me a, an A-10 squadron, they'll be great plus two squadrons. So you're going to end up with three if you send eight tons over there. So they're purely additive because they can't do what the COCOMs need them to do. So it would be really helpful from the COCOMs is, and it would help for the Air Force and for our Joint Force if the COCOMs made that point in their Hill engagements, to be honest. Can you picture Admiral Aquilino or 
General Cavoli or, or General Carrillo going over there and saying, hey, Congressman, I can't get the Air Force forces I need to do my mission because the Air Force doesn't have enough of what I need. And part of the reason is the Air Force can't divest the A-10s and utilize those airmen to field more of what I do need. That would be very helpful if the COCOMs would do that. Now, really addressing what you're getting at, what do they need? In every AOR, what we consistently see is a desire for modern sensors modern sensors that can find, fix, track, target, engage a myriad of threats in the area and on the ground. So that, I said modern sensors, I didn't say fifth gen, because this includes F-15Es and F-16s that we've upgraded with the ESA radars and modern EW, for example. Those upgrades that we're in the process of completing on those fighters that are part of the four plus one plan are all helpful to meet COCOM, COCOM demand. Now, meanwhile, as you get to areas that COCOMs have that are in closer proximity to more competent and capable adversaries, the unique attributes of aircraft like the F-22 and F-35, in addition to the modern sensors that they have, are in much higher demand due to survivability and some other things they can bring to the fight. And we simply don't have the capacity in that fifth-gen force that we need right now. Yeah, I'm like tightening my lap belt here as I'm getting fired up listening to your comments here, Corky, because you're hitting the nail on the head. And until people really emphasize this to their elected leaders of what the Air Force needs, we're looking at a pretty bleak future if it comes to going to war with a near peer threat. So I want to switch over to guns here because you served in the latter part of the Cold War and it was a much bigger force then, right? And how did that impact the dynamics that Corky's talking about right now? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Things have changed drastically from the days of the late Cold War. And of course, I was in USAFE during that period where we were sitting uh, alert with the F-111. And uh, of course, we had other opportunities to engage threats during the Libya raid. But during that time, we did have a very strong force of fighter aircraft stationed over in Europe. We had supply chains that at work. We were able to get the supplies, weapons and people to places when we needed them. Of course, now with the drawdown, the drastic drawdown that we've seen over the years, that is a much more difficult supply chain to stay on top of and to feed. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And, you know, it's just thinking if you're a Washington insider or a military strategist, or this is your first time listening to the Aerospace Advantage, you get it. The fighter force is stretched really thin. So, Doug, I've got to ask, what is the plan for a reset? Yeah, and John Corcoran referenced this, and there's a plan out there right now called 4 plus 1. And that's something that the Air Force leadership, especially General Mark Kelly, head of Air Combat Command, has championed in recent years. And it is looking at how do you come up with a balanced portfolio approach that is realistic, executable, and the dials can be turned now to reset the force. So at the top of that, You've got your F-22 and later next generation air dominance aircraft and family systems that is going to do the very high-end air-to-air mission set. And that is absolutely crucial for getting control of the sky. Like I said earlier, if you cannot handle a mission like air superiority in volume, joint power projection is not viable. And so that is absolutely essential. Right now, that is severely undersized. With the F-22, we are supposed to buy about 780 that later got cut to 381, and we only ended up with 187. And so we have been taking extreme risk in that category for quite some time. Next generation air dominance is supposed to help replace that with a newer set of capabilities, but the problem is it is going to probably be expensive. And so that is going to limit the quantities that we're able to get in total. And so just keep that in mind for that mission set. Next, you've got the F-35. And that is an aircraft that was always developed in parallel with F-22. So the F-22 brought very sophisticated air-to-air capabilities and then later added air-to-ground. But the F-35 was always very capable with stealth in the fifth-generation combination of sensors, processing power, connectivity, advanced electronic warfare. But it brought that to you at a lower price threshold. Now, there were some capability trade-offs, of course, to, to manifest that. but it was really supposed to bring key fifth generation attributes in massive volume. And it's still part of the mix for that. Then further down the line, you've got the F-15EX, which is a very new set of capabilities in an F-15 outer mold line that we've seen on ramps for a long time. And so think about that of having the sensors, the processing power, the connectivity, the ability to carry very large payloads, large munitions and all that. The problem with that, though, is it is not stealthy. While it does have some very new 
electronic warfare capabilities, not having the low observability baked in does have some limiting factors when and where it can go. Then further down, you've got F-16. And we still have a very sizable inventory of those aircraft. They are not new. They're many decades old. I mean, Slick, you put many an hour in those aircraft, and we're going to keep those online longer. And that is what is bringing your mass capacity for a price point that you can sustain. Not only do you already own these things, but the hourly operating cost. And Homeland Defense, think about operations in the Middle East or in Europe when the threat isn't super dialed up. They're still a very useful utility player. but. In that bench, you really see the F-35 stands in a very important role because it brings capability and capacity to the mix. And we touched upon this in the conversation earlier, and it's what Guns is talking about. But remember, in 1990, we had over 4,500 fighters on the line. Today, depending on how you count the numbers, we're down to about 2,100. When you apply the aircraft that are actually available for missions, so you you subtract what's in test and training and all that, you apply mission capable rates, you're down to about 900 some. And then of that, you look at what percentage is fifth generation. And that is very small. Like I said, we only bought 187 F-22s. Of those, about 100 are available for operations at any given time. Let's say you were to throw all those into theater at once. Okay, great. But then you figure out we actually rotate these things in so it's sustainable air power. So kind of divide that third, third, third. We figure a third are gen- generating to go out for a mission, or a third just finished up a mission, they're coming home, and another set are getting ready to launch. And all. You're down to about 30 at a given time. You stretch that out over an area of responsibility as big as the Pacific, that is an insanely small number. And F 35s, We simply have not scaled the buy fast enough to meet the original targets that we were supposed to have to fill in for what we knew were A-10s that had to retire, F-15s had to retire, F-16s had to retire, and all that. And so this is really the challenge we sit in. We've now got A-10s that average 41 years in age. F-15 Cs and Ds are about 38 years. F-16s are about 32 years age in, in average. And those aircraft have been worn very heavily. They they fly, they pull high Gs, they carry a lot of weight on board, they live outside, they've been flying combat for three decades straight. Even newer types, like an F-15E, are around 30 years old on average. And so this is just a modernization cycle that has got to occur. And we've always kicked the can on this. For the last several decades, we've had numerous reset plans, but it always kind of gets blown up because there is another priority. For 20 years, as Iraq and Afghanistan, or there was a Budget Control Act, which took a lot of money and really set modernization back. This is an enterprise that, if you do not reset it now, is going to be under acute stress. And we really saw signs of that this last fall when F-15s were retired from Kadena, and we simply did not have available new aircraft to backfill them because we hadn't been buying them enough for the last several years. And so to maintain a presence there, because obviously very important in the Pacific, we were just rotating aircraft through from other units. When you do that, those crews are not getting the training opportunities they need. You are really stretching the pilots and the maintainers, taking them out of their home station, and they're not available for other core missions. For example, we pulled F-16s out of Europe at the very same time Putin is fighting in Ukraine to go back to Kadena. I mean, that's robbing Peter to pay Paul. And so it's just a very important part of where we got to go is get real about reset. If it's always about program next, you're never going to have a program at all. Yeah, I can see like the tweet response from like a a Chinese general. Just It's just like the popcorn eating meme, like smiling and nodding like, yep, Doug, keep telling us all this stuff. You're making it really easy for us. Keep running down your force and, and don't focus on the Pacific. Yeah, it's just crazy to me where we're at right now. Corky, I want to shift over to you and just ask you plainly, why is the F-35 a unique part of this mix? Yeah, thanks for the softball there. It's pretty easy to follow what Doug just said. For all the reasons he hit on, it's simply said it's a sweet spot for capability, capacity, and affordability. It's available now. It's available in numbers, and we need the numbers. We have numerous allies and partners committed to the program for the long term. We just have to acknowledge this is where we are and get on with it. It's what we need to do as an Air Force and as a nation. We should have more F-22s. We don't. We need to field NGAD and the complementary CCA force to provide mass with it. True, but that's going to take time. And 
Time's a luxury we can't afford in the coming decade, or really for the foreseeable future. We're on a clock with some real adversaries, and they're probing us every day for weakness, and we don't want to give them any bright ideas. Yeah, I could not agree more. And Guns, I want to ask you this. The Air Force could have surged F-35 production a long time ago, but they didn't. And they were really vocal about wanting an aircraft that had technology with a refresh three and block four capabilities. So can you talk to us about what that means? Yeah, as Doug mentioned, TR3 is really the key to unlocking those block four capabilities. Some of those improvements that we have Due to the Block 4, and of course, the TR3 upgrade includes much higher processing rate, new computers. The integrated processor that's in the jet has been upgraded to to take in this amazing amount of data that's coming in from the sensors and the aircraft. Now, those sensors are being upgraded. There's a large hardware upgrade to the TR3 and going into Block 4. Some of the antennas throughout the aircraft that collect the uh, uh, electrons, the radar, the radar in the jet, it's going from the APG-81 to APG-85. We have all the visual systems that feed data into the pilot, such as the electro-optical targeting system, the EOTS, that's used for both air and ground targeting. Surface targeting can be over the surface or over the water. Also, the distributed aperture system, or DAS, that is a 360-degree set of cameras around the aircraft that feeds into the pilot's heads-up display, if you will. It's the HMD, the helmet-mounted display. It's a yeah, amazing helmet that the pilots have optics that can allow him to see throughout not only the aircraft and look visually through the aircraft, but behind him forward, again, in a 360-degree view. Now, what about teaming between actors in the battle space? That information is also provided to other aircraft. So if we have a group of, of say, a standard four-ship formation, they're all sharing information. The more aircraft you have, the better the information. What also is enabled by this upgrade for TR3 and Block 4 is being able to share that information with other fourth-gen platforms. Very important, especially when you have so many different aircraft going into a fight. It's not going to be all just fifth gen or sixth gen initially, it will be, but then we'll go into a more of a fourth gen fight as we get air dominance. But this ability to share information is not just aircraft, but also aircraft to ground. So we have our ground surface combatants for the Army, Navy, Marines that can share this information as well. All right. So how do we make sense of all of this information? There's a ton of data flowing into the cockpit. Ability to feed information to the pilot is a new panoramic cockpit display, a PCD. This is the largest cockpit glass display of any fighter. It is a touch screen that feeds data to the pilot, but it feeds it in a very smart way. Essentially, it is an artificial intelligence portal that tells the pilot the most critical information that he needs to know for mapping out the battle space and taking action. As part of that system, we have something called Fusion. Fusion takes all that data that I've talked about from our various sensors, feeds it into a processor, and then puts it out to either the pilot or to other aircraft in the formation. And you can very rightly think of fusion as artificial intelligence. It is essentially an artificial intelligence processor that will take data from the battle space, tell a pilot, interpret that information based on its deciphering of the electrons that are being brought in. All right, and what about carrying more weapons? We also have the capability with Block 4 to increase the amount of weapons that will go in the aircraft. We're expanding the weapon bay from, for example, carrying four AIM-120 missiles to six. We're expanding the weapon bay capability to include the internal carriage of the AIM-9X. Currently, we carry the AIM-9X out on the external stores. It'd be nice to carry those internally, which we can with Block 4. 
Also, small diameter bond. We have an upgrade, SDB2, which is able to, through a sensor in the nose, identify, target, and get armored tanks, personnel carriers, and other types of vehicles or buildings that can be targeted in a way that is essentially launch and leave. When you look at it, what this really allows the aircraft to do is better understand the battle space to know when and where to insert the jet, how to team with others, and really drill down on very challenging missions, especially things like the SAM suppression and electronic warfare and all of that. And that's really awesome. If I were going to boil it down, I would say it gives you two things, capability advantage and information advantage. But what we're watching unfold here from the capability advantage side of this is we are seeing the evolution real time of transitioning from a hardware first to a software first mindset. And that's an extremely important transformation in how we feel capabilities, not only for the F-35, but for all platforms going forward. The ability to upgrade the capabilities at the speed of relevance, at the speed the commercial sector does it, will help us maintain that capability advantage over any adversary. And then secondly, you heard guns talk a lot about information. So those capabilities allow you to collect information, share it at the speed of relevance, and basically get through your OODA loop faster than the bad guy, all right? So those two things, the capability advantage, the information advantage, lead to war winning advantage, war fighting advantage. Corky, let me throw this one at you. I mean, you saw this. You were one of the original F-22 guys, and you flew it throughout your career, putting the most modern examples we have. How did you see that evolve going from Gen 4 to Gen 5? That had to be pretty eye-watering. It was, it was absolutely eye-watering, right? The essay that you have in the airplane, with if pilot does nothing, was the phrase we used to use. You can turn on that airplane on the ground and go, oh, my goodness, I see everything that's going on around me as far as the sensors can see while I'm just sitting here stationary in 1G put it up in the air and you can see a lot further. The big disappointment was not being able to share it with others. And I'll hit on that here in a little bit. Appreciate that. Yeah, Doug, the Air Force basically is saying that it can buy, it's buying the F-35 as fast as it can get them. But really, what's the deal here? I mean, how do we increase the rate of modernization if we're capped at the current buys? I think when you look at it, first off, it all comes down to money. And this is a line that we have got to be very careful about how we invest in it, because we need to add the capacity. And the line was what they call level set in 156 aircraft per year a few years back, because they're trying to deal with a bunch of issues, whether it be the COVID impact, the Air Force's buys were kind of yo-yoing, there are other elements in play. And so they capped it at 156, and that's what they planned for. And then remember also, we kicked out Turkey from the program because they got those S-400 SAMs, and we were not happy about that. And so, again, that was another, because they produced a lot of components for the jet, that was another factor on capacity. We're not going to win this modernization curve with one massive surge of aircraft. You just can't build them that fast. We've got to be very, take the mindset of a marathon runner on this. You've got to max your buy every single year for many years. The Air Force has long said that they need to get to 72 fighters a year to really make a dent in the problem. And they did that this year in credit to them. We would actually argue it needs to go higher. And the reason for that is that we've got to get the fighter force younger writ large so that we are not spending so much on old aircraft that are breaking down more because they're just worn out. And it's like an old car. The older it gets, the more you have to spend on maintenance. We would prefer to see a 20-year refresh rate on the fighter fleet. That means you buy about 109 per year. And that allows you to in, have more available money to invest in new aircraft instead of just blowing your budget on sustaining the older ones. So again, it goes back to the supplier base. We need to invest that there's elasticity in there that they can go above the 156. And remember what's happened in recent years. You've had Germany come online. You've had Czech Republic. You've had a number of other countries enter, I mean, Finland and all that, with new F-35 buys. We joke that Putin is the best F-35 salesperson out there. He gets the free set of steak knives this month for quarterly improvement of sales. But we have to be able to accommodate those buys while handling our own production requirements and the Marine Corps and Navy and all that. And so, again, it's just back to money. We've got to make these investments so that there's elasticity back in the supply base. 
And it's not just a prime. It goes throughout the entire enterprise. The F-35 is made of thousands and thousands of subcomponents by suppliers around the country. And those really have to be stewarded carefully. The fact that Rheinmetall was just brought on board to make the center body and augment what Northrop Grumman uh, produces is a good news story in that front to add more capacity. But there are a lot more around that, that need attention. And then the final thing to hit is the hill. The cash has got to be consistent. When committees take marks against the jet, that means they pull money for a given reason. Normally, they send a signal or something like that. They're upset about something. That disrupts the the entire enterprise and really chews up that industrial base. And so when you see the buy kind of yo-yoing up and down, that is very difficult. And it does not lead to a healthy supplier base. And that's what this takes. And so the Air Force and the other services and the allies need to buy this thing as, at a higher rate in a sustained fashion as possible. But you got to have a supplier base that can match it. Guns, we've had delays with testing TR3 and Block 4 capabilities, which components the challenges we're discussing. And the Air Force is less than pleased and is refusing to accept jets until Block 4 software is complete. Lockheed Martin is manufacturing these jets, and the jets are going to be parked at Fort Worth until the end of 23 or early 24. So how do we help accelerate the testing? Yeah, that's a very important point that you're making there because the jet, the F-35, with the TR-3 and Block 4 upgrade, has essentially outgrown our capabilities on ranges, on open air ranges, to test to the full extent of the capabilities of the jet. So what do we do? There's a couple of options that have been adopted starting a few years ago, and that's called the simulation distributed mission operations. There's a software that is being used in the simulators called the joint simulation environment. And that allows aircraft testing, actual aircraft software testing, in a simulator that is tied to other F-35s, other F-22s, and other air assets virtually through a distributed mission operation. And it can be one simulator can be on one side of the country and the other over in Europe even. The simulator, turning to the simulator to test block four is really going to be a key when it comes to the high level capabilities of the F-35 that we don't want to test in an open air environment. And there's been a lot of stumbling blocks with the joint simulation environment. And that is why we have not had a final operational test and evaluation report for the F-35 so we can go into full rate production. However, very soon they should be complete with final upgrades to the JSE, Joint Simulation Environment, so they can press forward with that testing, satisfy dot and and of course get a report to Congress so they can go with the full rate production. Yeah, Guns, thanks for that. It really sheds a light on what's going on and what the next steps are. Doug, do any other folks really have to dial in to achieve the goals that we need for F-35 to deliver on time? Yeah, everybody owns a piece of this. First off, industry has huge responsibilities, the prime, the suppliers. Right now, we've got this software challenge on Block 4 because the central processing computer for TR3 was late. These things compound. It's a hugely complex set of circumstances there. DOD and the Joint Program Office and the services, they obviously own huge components of this. And maintaining stable requirements and really trying to standardize the buys and all that and the standards in play, that's huge. And then obviously Congress, they've really got to hold the funding and the oversight elements in a consistent level, not give me a free pass, but hold it consistent. And you've seen things ping around a little bit too much in recent years that has not led to stability and, and that leads to longer timelines. Sure. Now, Corky, I want to lean into your experience here as an Eagle weapons officer who saw the F-22 come online and you were one of the first to fly it. I'm sure you guys had teething problems. So how do we know when we're solving these problems that we're talking about and what do solutions look like? Yeah, I'm going to be a very big picture here. I'd say it's a pretty simple metric. It's a healthy force. And all the things we've been talking about here, that means we got enough fighter squadrons, organized, trained, and equipped to meet a reasonable level of COCON demand. Right now, we don't have that. we got a shortage of aircraft. We've got a shortage of pilots. We've got a shortage of maintainers. And that's just to name a few in our Air Force. And the limited forces we have aren't getting enough opportunity to train and prepare for a high-end adversary because of this insatiable COCOM command. So we're just not healthy. But we can get there. With the right level of investment, the right focus, and a disciplined approach, we can get there. Yeah, and so now I've got to ask the counter to that. If we don't, Corky, you know, what's the risk involved with failing to hit the marks? 
I think this is a pretty simple one too. I think General Brown said it best: accelerate change or lose. Losing is the risk, and so the next go. What's losing look like from the adversary perspective? It's we failed to deter them. They thought the choice they were going to make that the benefit outweighed the cost that we can impose on them. So then they choose to use force to achieve some sort of revisionist objective like we're seeing happening right now in Ukraine. And we've talked about some other adversaries that might choose to try to do that too if we look weak. There's a failure to assure. If your allies and your partners lose faith and start leaving the team, that is not good. That's losing in my book. So ultimately, this goes back to my first comments I made on risk. In the near term, if we choose to prioritize this COCOM mission risk over our risk to force, the forces we have will not be sufficient in times of crisis, and our strategy will fail. So the only way out of this is to build back our force structure. That is how we'll minimize the strategic risk. That will require, though, in the near term, some additional risk to mission. So we got to accept that. we got to make those tough choices if we really want to move forward in the right direction. Now, it's like I'll weigh in really fast here. For the past 20 years, we fought two wars, and we lost them in slow motion. And people walking down the street in America didn't really feel too many tangible consequences. Obviously, there were families that were significantly affected with service members wounded or killed, and that's tragedy. But big picture, people didn't feel it. When we look at where China is going and their values and the competition underway, if we lose that fight, that is truly an existential moment for this country that every single American will feel in severely adverse ways, ways that we haven't had to think about since the Cold War or World War II. It is time to get real about solving that now so we don't have to face that reality. And that, like I said, it's a marathon solution. We got to get on with it. Yeah, I could not agree more. And I can't say thanks enough for everybody weighing in on some of these things. But I don't want to end this podcast on a downer, especially since we have Corky with us. So I want to ask you about one of your favorite fifth gen flying stories. And when did you really see the power of this technology click? Yeah, that's a great question. Lots of options to choose from here, but I suppose one of the most eye-opening moments for me, and I think for many of us in the F-22 community at the time, came back in early 2006 at Langley Air Force Base. We had just declared initial operational capability in December of 05 for the 27th Fighter Squadron, which is our first operational 5th Gen Squadron. And I was getting shipped off to my first staff tour at the Pentagon at the time. I guess that was my consolation prize. Anyway, for my final flight at Langley, we set up our first large force mixed employment mission. It was the first time we'd flown a big mission with multiple F-22s and F-15Cs on the same side. It was a defensive counter air mission with me in the lead of four F-22s and had four F-15Cs as well. And we were up against what felt like the entire East Coast that day. It was F-18s out of Oceana, F-16s from Atlantic City, F-15s from Langley, all simulating advanced enemy fighters. And then even a couple of B-52s that happened to be in the area training that day joined the fight. So. The eight of us, four F-15s, four F-22s, outnumbered about three to one by the fighters and dealing with the bombers, defending a notional island. The results really surprised us all. So we didn't lose a single F-15C or F-22 on the blue side, but what was even better was the F-15Cs didn't even get shot at. And the F-22s were never (laughs) detected. And and that was because of the synergy between the two that we just hadn't realized because we hadn't done it. We effectively made each other more lethal. The F-15s didn't have to get as close to the bad guys because they have what we call the F-22 insurance policy that could go in and clean up the merges. And the F-22s were a lot harder to find than if we'd been out there by ourselves because the big juicy targets that were the F-15s on the bad guy radars allowed us to hide better. So the two of us paired together were better than either of us could have been alone. You know, and out of that, a few years later, under General Mosley's direction, we established the F-22 weapon school embedded it in the 433rd Weapon Squadron with the F-15C, and rapidly those experts expanded those tactics and evolved them to include 4th to 5th gen integration with F-16s, 15Es, F-18s, etc. The two big lessons that came out of that for us, in addition to to the synergy I talked about, was we, we all realized right then we could have been a lot more lethal if we had a common data link, that information advantage that we talked about earlier. 17 years later, that's finally getting fielded in the Raptor, so we're going to be able to offboard information here with the latest upgrade they're putting in, but we cannot make that mistake moving forward with NGAD, CCAs, et cetera. The real-time data sharing, information sharing is a must across the force. Second, we would have been lethal if we had more numbers, and we've hit on numbers a lot today. The F-22 build was cut short just a few years after this, this story that I'm referencing, and we all know that, but this example reinforces the goodness that is the 4 plus 1 plan and the need to ramp up the F-35 production like we've been talking. Amazing. Yeah. It's awesome when you have those sorties where at the end, 
you hear a picture clean and you just want to like yell, bring us your champion over the radio because you just you're feeling so good on the blue side. So I really appreciate you sharing that story. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, Corky, Guns, Doug, thank you so much for making the time to chat today. And I really appreciate your insights. Thank you, Slick and Guns and Doug. Great discussion. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Hey, thanks, Slick. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.